The year is 2054. As far as I know, I'm the last surviving human being in New York City. No, this is not that kind of film. I don't know what kind of film this is, but this is not that kind of film. It would be fun to be in one of those films, though. I really wish I could get behind the idea of being in films like that. Like, what's wrong with what? What's wrong with just having fun and do a film like that? That starts out, it's 2054 and I'm the last surviving human being in New York City. I would like to have that experience. I want to have that experience. Well, you know, we are here in beautiful, where are we? We're in beautiful, uh, rural Phoenix. That's right. We're in rural Phoenix, Arizona. It's April the 22nd. It's actually Earth Day. And Good Friday. And Good Friday. So that doesn't happen. It's Earth Day today? Yep. All right, I'm going to try to give you a couple of um, setups for the day. All right. So we get some clean ones. Thanks. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's April 22nd, it's 2000... Oh, there's some cigarro. Oh, I love it. Uh-huh. Is that... Uh, there's tall cactus. That's like the wily coyote cactus. That's right, and birds make little holes and nest in it. Isn't that interesting? What a metaphor for life that, you know... It's everything. It is. You can, the uh, you can get water from it. Wow. It's Earth Day, April the 22nd, and we are in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. And it is gorgeous and hot. Beautifully hot, you know? It's a dry heat. You it know sure say? is. It's a very dry heat that makes your hair go very straight. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's true. It's even straightened out my hair. I actually had an afro before I got to Phoenix. Uh-oh. Tight curled afro. <laughs> and now my hair that's is gone. straight. And it's gone. Yes. Um, we just went to the local Fry's Pharmacy, which is an enormous establishment. Mm -hmm. I joined it. We have a member here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Card carrying. <laughs> when would be a good time to officially call in people? The other people? Yeah, because it's I not thought it was today. next Sunday. Next Sunday. Uh, but just so everyone knows, since everyone is here right now, I, I'm not going to be here next Sunday because of Rosh Hashanah because I'm going to be home for the weekend. Why don't you can stay for it, Rosh Hashanah and go night? Yom Kippur? Can we do it on a weeknight? What time are we supposed to start? Maybe we can do an evening rehearsal on Sunday night. Yeah. Would well, that be easier for you? No, I'm actually... Well, I mean, I'm, I, if I'm DJing across the street at 8.30. Well, you when? really laid a lot of time open for rehearsal on Sunday. Well, <laughs> I have to have Rosh <laughs> I mean, I, I scheduled it around rehearsal originally, and then I have, then I've rushed on and came up. <laughs> <laughs> this ancient holiday just, just <laughs> propped up. Well, it's different every year. It's never set. It's not like, it's huh? It's yeah, not it's like a different day ancient, every year. Ancient things just are all over Well, look, the place. I feel like we have to just... Real, can't <laughs> now. I don't know. I mean, we have to no, we, begin just, at some point. No, but I mean, I, I can, I, what I can do is I can try to be there by four. I can try to be there by four. I mean, you can just, we can just start at 2 and I'll be there at 4. Maybe if it's going to be easier... That's cool. I think 2 is a safe, good two. safe time. It leaves time in the evening to go home and chill out before your week. I mean, I'll be there at some point. So it won't Should be we do, before. like, 2 to 6? Yeah, we can do... Yeah, it's yeah. fine. I think that's good. We started on 42nd Street as a company, and we were transforming Ross spaces on 42nd Street between 6 and Broadway, which is what's now 1 Bryant Park, or the Bank of America building. So before it was that, it was a Tad Steak and a Pronto Pizza and a 25-cent peep show place and Dwayne Reed. And as each one of those places, their leases ran up. They weren't renewed so that they could just let everyone's lease expire and then level the block and build the one Bryant Park. 
September 11th happened and a lot of stuff happened in there that just me meant that we were in those rows of storefronts for like five years or something, six years. And so we would get access to these really wonderful spaces and that's what we wanted to do is completely detraditionalize and move away from what we felt were these kind of the cultural institutions at the time which were you can really only do a certain amount of things in those spaces and I feel like we all collectively had a much larger vision than that. So we'd work our jobs at FIT or wherever it was that we were working. And then all night we would spend building and transforming. And you know, I became an electrician because I taught myself how to rewire the whole space. And like we were all doing construction we all had and set work. That kind and of we construction all, jobs in a way. So yeah. we would we all knew how to make a theater an out of painter out of a space out of a space that didn't have a theater. And then and so we would build really, these yeah. very specific spaces that you know. The first one that we did, which was episode 23, Garvey and Superpants, we built a scale model of an old vaudeville theater that was inside of this basement of this old deli. And so you'd walk off the street and there was this door with all this graffiti on it and you'd go down and part these red curtains and go into this little jewel box space with 23 seats. And then for another show that we did called Placebo Sunrise, which was a few doors down, we had this really long Masonic building that was cut in half and one side was a fresco. Tortillas, tortillas, which is the dead rats in the basement we found out. After we'd been eating there for a long time and finally got into the shared basement, there was all these exploded rats in the basement near. <laughs> it was disgusting. Uh, <laughs> so we transformed that space into, some people called it a cruise ship, we called it a hotel, but it was this really long, narrow space with a lot of doors, and we'd create these very elaborate musical theater meets farce meets surrealist kind of intellectual madness and they were a lot of fun. We'd build our own bars. We were really building sort of very uh, bespoke environments that you would come into. It was different than anything that was happening at the time. So it was really a moment that we really seized this moment. It was a real estate moment in New York. It was a moment in our lives. We all came together. We all had really diverse backgrounds and we all sort of met and formed this unwieldy beast which was the NTUSA. We, it, it doesn't, well, it's just, it's just different than uh, how we would do it in concert, I guess. It's like, na 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 or the way we do it in concert is like, da na 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 Let's just, let's try the, let's try us starting as we would in concert, but you guys don't give an accent to when you come in. That's all. Wait, I've always wanted to know about the, the origin of the oh, name, sheriff. the sheriff. Yeah, the sheriff? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what's up with all that? All right. I'll tell you, but it's a really it's not, not a good story. <laughs> well, make it good. <laughs> make it good. Uh, yeah, embellish a little. Bit. No, I was teaching a master class. I was there were violinists and violists playing for me, and a violinist, of course, like I, I play the viola, so I know nothing really about the violin. But she was playing the Viotti Twenty Second Concerto. Do you know that? I know. I yeah. Know, yeah. Everybody knows. I mean, I any violinist probably knows that concerto. I actually don't know. How many did he write? Like, that's like at an incredible amount of... Three. At least so 22. I know, because I played the 23rd, oh, okay. so I know there's 23. But well, that's, <laughs> that's already like an incredible amount of violin concertos oh, oh, to write. You mean 20 second concerto? 20 second concerto. 20 second. Definitely not. The whole time I was definitely thinking about it. I was like, wow. Oh, 20 wow, 20 seconds. Wow, 20 seconds. That's a good idea. <laughs> you can play like six of them. <laughs> All right. Any, anywho. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so she was playing, and like I, I was watching from the audience, and like there, there was a real disconnect because like she was, she had a really tiny sound, I thought, in the class, and, and she's rather large. She's like six feet. And I don't, yeah, she's like six feet tall. Like almost. And big boned. Like. Big boned. I was getting frustrated. I tried a few things. You know, it's like, what do you think the character of this music is? You know, do you think it's strong? I mean, it starts pretty, you know, Molto dramatico. Do do see you do know. So she's, she's sitting there and like, I, I try everything, every, Everything I can do. Everything in the book. You know, everything in the book. You know, whatever book that is. And I, I just, you know, it just, nothing was working. I wasn't getting through. Finally, I just thought, you know, I'll just try this. And, and I told her to imagine that we were in the Old West. 
<laughs> yeah, like, and, and I was challenging her to a duel. And, you know, I wanted her to draw her pistol, you know, which was her bow, right, to the oh, instrument. Snap. Right. And, like, fire to the, to the instrument. And I think, oh. you know, we tried that a couple times, and I think it actually helped, didn't it? Yeah, but it oh, was, it was, there. the <laughs> demo was great because, of course, like this is, it starts off high on the violin, which means like really high on the viola. So the sheriff, like, drew his bow, you know, and and like played like, why, you know, and it was like, and, and, and that was when our friend who is a professor there and had asked us to come there was like, the sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> we were cleaning the basement of 111 where yeah. we did Garvin Super Pants. Yeah. One night we're sitting on these cinder blocks and we get some pronto pizza and we come downstairs. Which is bad and we're, pizza, we're anyway. just totally exhausted, <laughs> you know, after having worked all day, we get there and we're just starving, you know, and there's uh, dust Tired, floating up everywhere. Having worked already. I go to take a bite of my pizza, I don't know, some spontaneous combustion happens and it just <laughs> flies out of my hand and lands like cheese down, cheese down on, the, on, the, on the cement basement floor where like rats, where Hootie yeah. was like cleaning up dead rats. And I started laughing. <laughs> and, and I was just like, <laughs> I just, you know, without even thinking, just like picked it up and, and started eating. <laughs> and I had, I had this like flash to myself, like sitting in fifth grade and like the teacher said, Thing. This is where you're going to be when you're yeah. 28 years old, you know? And I was like, <gasps> <laughs> like I heard that uh, Jana Starker, the cellist, he smokes like a chimney, and he would light a cigarette and stick it in his student's mouth while they played, and if the ash broke while they were playing, they had to start over from the beginning, and this was an exercise to try to get them to not have any facial tension when they play it so they don't make funny faces. Oh, that's interesting. My, my teacher used to tell me to release my pelvis. Oh, God. <laughs> and if you knew my teacher, you know, or that pelvis. would be like, or my pelvis. <laughs> if you knew my pelvis. She was a guru of sorts. I mean, like, it sounds like she did have a way that was unorthodox of addressing tension well, problems. Well, it's funny because right? I think it's all relative, like, to the time that you, that you live in. I mm -hmm. mean, at her time, you know, her thing was all about, like, if you're not playing relaxed, you know, you're not doing it right. But at the time, that was really different. I mean, going back like 19th century, like you see these, <laughs> these books. You know, I don't know if they were uncomfortable at the time, but, but the idea was that you would actually hold a book under your arm. You know, get this sort of 19th right. century Pierre um, bio sort of stance. You know, here and and that stuck for a long time. And the the idea was like, yeah, you should be uncomfortable, because that's correct posture. You, you should, should suffer for like, the art. She was like, like, yeah, you have to suffer dance. for it. She was yeah. like. You know, that's, that's, that's bullshit, you know, like you have to play relaxed, being able to be free and access your, your inner, uh, your gut. I mean, it's not, so. it's, it doesn't sound strange coming from a dance perspective. Mm. Yeah. I mean, and if I looked at you as a dancer, I would say like, his <laughs> pelvis looks a little tight. Or I, I, I mean, yeah. I would, you, you would see that. That would be go for pretty no, much yeah. every musician, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> I, as Mark Morris says, how hard is it to turn on a classical musician? That was what he said upon oh. finding out that, uh, you know, something was going on. <laughs> oh. I look at this weather and this landscape and I often wonder what I'm doing living here. I mean, it just sometimes feels like such a cold, hard place to live. And people live in Bali, people live in Hawaii, people live in Costa Rica. There's part of me that really feels like I have to be in some kind of struggle state in order to be making something productive of myself. As if being in some beautiful tropical environment would would be too easy or would would somehow lessen the the work that I was trying to do well, that may be true I'm not quite sure why I guess I feel at times that a, that struggle is somehow getting infused into my work 
into the creative process and somehow making things stronger but I mean the reality is that I'm not really doing all that much work as it is so why not just be comfortable why not take that that full time job that I've been putting off someone says well it's really expensive in Hawaii you know the cost of living is it's really high it's really high as if the cost of living in New York City is not really high and, and pe yet people do it people actually exist in Hawaii my mother Italian Irish lady 19 years old when she had me she loved television. She loved movies. Uh -huh. That was how she bonded with her old world Italian grandfather. Okay, my blood so grandfather. there's another reason to go into showbiz. Huge. I mean, imagine my mother, sickly, on the couch, has a hysterectomy in 1978. Aww. And after that, she was addicted to the pain medication that would eventually, you know, kill her. And she's like, you know, sort of cashed out, but entertained by television, interested yeah. in the lives of the actors, interested in the history, the genealogy. It was almost like my ancestry, since I didn't know my real father, it's almost like my ancestry was the ancestry of the movies. Because she would tell me about things. We refer back to like, you know, uh, I don't know, Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee and the right. casting process for Gone with the Wind and, you know. Right. And I was like, oh, this is something that has to do with me, you know. And so... There was probably a natural inclination I had toward it all, right. plus that force working on the other side, which was, see this thing on the television, this little, this little machine in the corner is doing something that I very much approve of, and I love it. And my parents were always watching TV, and so it's no coincidence that in my life as an adult, you know, I got onto a that was television a pleasure, show. Pleasurable thing that made everybody happy. Made everybody happy, and it was like. That was an, that was acceptable. That was like honorable. It was it was worshipped. And you know, here's the ego part. The ego part of me wanted to be worshipped. Wanted to be like really super duper loved and attended to. I talked to uh, Amy Clark, the uh, oh, potential good. costume designer. Sure. Maybe her and Penelope could do it together. Or something what happened to me? What about Kelly? What if we love Kelly? What if she comes in and we're like, holy shit. Who's Kelly? Well, we Kelly. Her to no, once. the idea no, was... Where, where but is John, she? the idea was that we would, if we're not going with Alicia, who's our person, you right. know, that we have the relationship with, then we would just interview a few people. Right, that's, right? that's what I'm setting up, an interview with Kelly. Mm -hmm. All right, She's one of the few more. people. No, and I'm saying, so let's also have an interview with, with Kirsten. Great. Cut. This is a kind of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Potential arguments. We have. You know, we, we have a collaborative company, theater company, which means that there's not any one, it's a democratic process, a messy democratic process. We don't vote on everything. I don't even know how to describe Eventually it. Eventually it became, I mean, it started off as a sort of, the name of the company is the National Theater of the United States of America, and it was this patriotic thing, like, sincerely, like, we are, we are, doing starting over like we're the founding fathers and mother and um, that we're gonna operate in this democratic way using these words and it turned out to be more like I think the word was like consensus based instead of like those words because it was just like there was never any voting or any like oh well it's you know three people voted yes and two people voted no it's just like we kinda had to hash it out until everyone was okay with it so that was the different seeming to me, that was, my, I realized one day, it's like, okay, that's different. And um, that's really hard. I mean, and the more people you have doing it, the crazier it is, you know. So, we I'm all sure come from <laughs> you're nodding your head. <laughs> yeah. Sure. I mean, it's hard enough with the four of us in Brooklyn Rider, and then we also all play in an orchestra together called The Knights. It's 35 people, or depending on the project, you know. But it's, it's somewhat similar in that it, it, it's once in a while there's a vote but it's usually not about an important thing you know it's usually consensus so that just takes a lot of time as messy as you said and um, yeah it's it's difficult but rewarding I think uh, yeah some I mean of the time I, I guess I still others. believe yeah. in all of those same things and yeah. that's still the way I want to operate it's 
it's still true that what I do by myself is not the same as what I'm doing with, with other people whose point of view I initially don't understand or don't get. And that's something I really have learned in this group is that honestly, like I think differently than all of you guys. That's something that like I, it has sunk in. It's made a difference and that's like a life thing. You know, it's like people you don't get, like let them in and the bad ideas will fall away and the good ones will rise up and you don't have to like, like that was when we were at the height of our arguing and you don't have to do. It was actually right before. It was right before the height of the arguing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't remember that. <laughs> it was on the way to the summit. Yeah, it was on the, we were on our way. I remember yeah. the arguing pretty early on. I, I mean, do too. Sure, we <laughs> argued a lot. But it really came to a head, I think, in that, pro in that but process. But it did not continue after that. There was not an yeah, arguing. Yeah, we made a change we, after that. We, yeah. we decided no more. Yeah. Well, we didn't decide. I think we just argued it all out. Yeah. Like, I had a teacher do. once yeah. who told me that I was a horrible writer, <laughs> but I had won like all of these state competitions <laughs> and like stuff <laughs> for writing. And then this one teacher totally traumatized me, and I thought for years afterwards that I was a horrible writer. But then, like later in life, I encountered other people, and they're like, "Oh, you're a really good writer. You should really like write." But I had like really almost given it up because of this one person who was like, "You're not a very good writer." That's horrible. I think that should be against teacher. Like, you've all had teachers. Like, how have you not yeah. done that? My viola so. teacher in high school told me to not even dream of making a profession. <laughs> oh, my dad. Yeah, my dad. Wow. My, dad's, my dad's violin teacher. When my dad started violin, he plays viola now. But when my dad started violin, he was like, you better quit now. Wow. You take wow. a viola. No. Wow. No, it's like, you gotta quit. Well, the tricky thing is, like, you know, it's like this border between, like, totally you know, feeling like a, a real commitment to something, no you know, deep inside. And like somebody at the time who might see what, what's coming out at that moment, but somebody at the time making a judgment on that, you know, it's really hard. Also, uh, what does that judgment, you know, relate to? Well, it like, reflects you know, their own. In, exactly. you know, it reflects their own yeah. stuff. In, yeah, exactly. exactly. In Uzbekistan, you know, this violin teacher something. who's like, he teaches violin, you know, <laughs> saving a kid by telling him to quit playing, you know. Was like, yeah, that was that his really agenda. Yeah, 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 what does that do? Really? A guidance counselor right. at my yeah. high school you know, when I was looking at places to go, and I was, I was telling her, you know, that I'm going to apply for Juilliard. Right. She said to me, oh, maybe you should think about the community colleges. That happened to me, too. You know, because, yeah. you know, Juilliard is for really... <laughs> like, yeah. what? When I was in high school, we had a mandatory session with the guidance counselor, and so I went in, and she said, okay, what do you want to do? And I said... Oh, I'm going to be a ballet dancer. <laughs> and she said, oh, okay. Wait, wait, time out. Uh, no, let's well, rewind. let's look through our file. Of, um, <laughs> there was like a, you know, file cabinet, and it was like, dancer, okay. She looks, op she opens the thing, and it says, uh, okay, well, I, I see two alternatives for you in case that doesn't work out. It's either circus performer. What you could have done. Or dog trainer. <laughs> <laughs> and either Which way, it involves way. a lot of shoveling of shit. Circus performer said that? Yeah. I think that's horrible. Oh Is that better Wait, than okay, a dance? That's better than a ballet <laughs> I think I was in the sixth grade casting some show with the ninth graders or something and they needed a, somebody to play the little girl and I tried out and I thought I was great and I didn't get the part some little blonde curly one got the part but I never doubted that that's all I wanted to do it, it's odd I just thought anybody who was in theater and didn't keep it up or left, I thought, what? what? Uh, it's not, uh, it was, I j you just had to. I have this memory of walking home from school in the cold and trying not to exhale. Walking and trying to avoid letting out any vapor, any condensation with the hope that maybe someone would be driving by, a scientist in fact, would be driving by and notice me and say, hey wait, that 
boy there. There's no condensation. There's no vapor coming out. That boy there could be an alien. And they would, they would try to capture me and, and bring me in for evaluation, for testing. A strange memory. I was reading this thing about Charles Ives recently and oh, his okay. dad, and he was like, you know, for the people singing in a church choir, it was he was so against the idea of like they had to sing on in key. Like he was very happy right. if it, like that they started off in one key and ended up somewhere else because yeah. that was just what they were feeling, and so they went with it. I mean, that brings message. up like the professional versus a amateur spirit. You know, right. at, at, at one point, and as a kid, you are like a pro you are an amateur, you know, you, you sure. are. And, and mm -hmm. so at that point, your interest is more important than, in a way, your proficiency at whatever yeah, right. totally. you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. My mom said that to me one time. She said, uh, I was always afraid you'd either grow up to be gay or a serial killer. <laughs> I was like, thanks, Mom. <laughs> to have a situation where you can be the performer, but you can also say, I think we should make a breakaway wall and I'm gonna make it tonight and you guys are gonna use it tomorrow. You know, like that's awesome. It makes you feel more generous to other people and their ideas and it's just like it's, it was a, it was about the ideas that we were talking about and what we had in common in terms of like wanting to create a really alive, really like relevant theater situation, but it was also about having, let everybody having a voice of value in the room and having, that was it for me, you know, like, I, would, I could do that forever, that's what I thought at the time, and I still sort of feel that way, you know, like, without any ownership over the, pro the project, it's not the same. We were like a freedom machine, you know, like, we just <laughs> wanted to be free, and we wanted to, when you came and saw our shows, we wanted you to be, feel so unmoored and free that you were compelled to jump up on stage and join us in some way, and some people in the audience said, it was this close to jumping up during Placebo Sunrise. Why do this you close do that to jumping. For people? Why do you want to do that? It's for totally. People? I, that's what I want. It's totally liberating. To me, it's about like we're all in the same boat, and we're not making something separate from you. It's about making something that's really fun, that gives you a lot of ideas, a lot of contradictory perspectives. But that's like the human experience to me, and I feel like, you know, to me, that's worth doing. Like you know. When we, d when we did shows that went well, you think this is totally better than if we had not done it. You know, like <laughs> this, <laughs> there wasn't anything here. No one was doing this. Then we did this. That I think things are better now that we did this. It feels better. It, people have come up to me and said, that show changed my yeah, life. Thank you. You know, like not a lot of people, like two. No, but, no, no. I, but, get that, I get that a lot. That's but a lot. you know, that's a lot. Two, I mean, that's two people. I mean, honestly, if two people felt that way about something that I created, I was part of creating, like that's, it's like an ego thing too. It makes me feel awesome, makes me feel great. And it makes me like feel more generous, feel like doing it more. You know, it's like a positive ball. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> positive mm -hmm. ball, that's what we used to play, positive, positive ball, ball all the time. We called it posi ball yeah. back in the hood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> posi ball. I'm thinking about getting a Kmart credit card so I can oh, have right. some credit. <laughs> no, because I don't have any. And that means bad credit. You can credit. get unlimited credit from Kmart. Don't. I got a Marshalls card <laughs> once. I bought a $22 pair of pants and it ended up costing me like $120. But not if you pay it. Not if you pay for it. I couldn't. Who has That's time the whole point. Pay these things. <laughs> That's the whole point. Yeah. Can't. As a veteran, like you don't pay them. As a veteran. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's dead the whole veteran. thing. Like, you, you have the you worst pay credit the card thing. debt of any one of us here. Maybe. Yeah. Possibly. He's credit the fattest, debt. and he has the most debt. Credit oh, card debt. debt. I have more debt than him. I have more you debt. Have more I have the most debt. debt. Yeah, and you, you have, have more, more credit actual, card debt. Yeah, I have more and credit card debt. And what? Post school. I have the most ignored debt. Oh, this is good actually. James, how did you accrue a lot of your credit card debt? Well, travel, expensive clothes. <laughs> yes, episode 23. Didn't it have something to do with the theater we make? Yeah, whoa, whoa, yeah. whoa, let's step back. Episode 23, what was <laughs> that? <laughs> well, that goes all the way back to 2001. We were just a, we were a burgeoning theater company. Young and foolish. We're just and a couple of hacks fooling around in a basement. <laughs> <laughs> That's really bad. 
Yeah. That was an $8,000 present to yourself. Yeah. yeah. Seeing your first <laughs> written play produced. Right. Actually, your second, probably. Right. Mm. That's a nice present. Yeah, that was a good present. A good present. Yeah. 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 It's worth eight grand. Yeah. Saw so it go now to it Dublin. Is. And now it's 15 grand. Plus interest. interest. <laughs> <laughs> Before I'm that done, it'll be a $40,000 question. <laughs> the show started off at 8000 and went to 17000 The budget The budget on that show is keeps going up. Yeah, it keeps accumulating. <laughs> the longer the we don't long perform it. The show has long since ended. Yeah. <laughs> I often think I've got to try another city. There's not even the need to live in a specific place there. I've got to go there to do this thing. It's just the concept of moving, of taking the risk of trying a new place. Maybe the farthest I would say would be Paris. I like to think I would be the kind of person that could pick up and move to Paris. Who the hell am I kidding? I'm not, I can't, I would never do that. Tokyo definitely seems like the kind of place in my fantasy world I would be able to just pick up and, and try out Tokyo, but I know I would never in a million years go without having a reason. It just seems like another world to me, and it scares me, but I do find that there's value in that, and that's the kind of risk I would would like to be willing to take, but um, I don't know. Maybe some things are just simply not practical. I mean, you've got two kids, and what are you going to do? Just pick up and move to Tokyo. We also did, we did very large ambitious projects that were just financially ridiculous, you know, like we built a ride that was also a show of 400 years of American history seen through the lens of a time-traveling game show. Uh, and we physically moved the audience on this platform that we built. And this went, happened, right? This happened. Yeah, this happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And went through all of wow. history. Yeah. All of history. And all alternate versions of American history as told through Howard Zinn and all sorts of these things that you don't really learn in history books. Uh, you don't learn in public school. It was like the audience started on one end of this space and then there was a curtain and then the curtain went away and then there was a set over here and a set over here. And you drive down through a 4,000, it's about a 150 foot, 4,000 square foot warehouse and you would dock into different stages and then different stages would roll in around you. Wow. It's so a really it small audience, right? 30 people, yeah. And so, you know, very I think... Hard, very hard to push those 30 yeah, people. Yeah, we were going to motorize it, and then that didn't work out. But in the last <laughs> show, we used that. We had an engineer say, you only need about 250 pounds of pressure to, you know, with the 10,000 pounds of audience that are on there and the drag force of the wheels, you only need about 250 yeah, pounds so of pressure. Yeah, so I was responsible so like, for about 150 that. pounds of that <laughs> yeah. pressure. Well, sometimes you get stuck, <laughs> wow. and there'd only be two people available who no, were doing well, something to push it. Like, I mean, if we're going to talk about this, opening night... We had a full audience. We had not tried it with a full audience before. Hey. There were two of us were designated to push this thing. Everyone else had costume <laughs> changes and places they had to be. Matt and I jumped behind it. I was one of the two. And we realized immediately it wasn't going anywhere. Wow. We weren't going to get anywhere with this. And, <laughs> get with it. and I see James like changing into his next thing. And I'm calling him from off, you know, from off stage. Like, we need more hands on this. We're not. We're not going to oh get anywhere. Gosh. People are waiting to do the. You know. Anyway. No. What happened? What happened? He ran out. I think the we, had, we on, ended up man. with like four. You know, instead of two people, we initially had we four adjusted. people, and and we had to get some more grease on the but wheels. Like, you and remember a bunch when you other... get there and your feet are like? Oh yeah, yeah we had we'd, to. We'd, we'd be to, like really you know, bent down. Spit on and the like bottom our of our shoes, like, and yeah. I was just counting the shows that we had left of how many times I had to push that. How many shows was that? We ended oh, up doing about do. 60. Yeah. Not to think of that show. We did like 40. 40? Wow. Because yeah. I thought Placebo Sunrise we felt did 62. Felt like 60. I just remember, like 60 I remember at one point my friend Matt and I are done pushing, you know, and, and, and we weren't going to be in the next scene, so we got a minute to kind of sit back for a second while the audience moved into the next position. And we were just saying, you know, 10 more to go, 10 more shows to go. And he was living on the set, actually. Oh, yeah, that yeah, Matt was he, living he, there. Yeah. He had some rent issues. <laughs> <laughs> some girlfriend issues. No, he too, lived yeah. behind the saloon. Yeah, he lived behind the saloon set. Oh, Scary. Yeah, wow. there were rats. Oh, yeah. Also, this movement thing, I feel like we have to be really careful, like, when the movements of the thing happens, because that can yeah. get old. What movements? Immediately. Oh, the riser. Oh, like, absolutely. after the first time it happens, in a way, like, you know, if it's moving forward, I feel like we should really play with, if it's moving this way, things start here, so you have to turn around to see what's going well, on. Maybe in yeah. the beginning it can move, it can, it can come back toward the doors. 
you know, maybe it, it can move, o- move what away do we have as, so far? as James and John step off of the opening, you know, scene and they kind of like take a few steps forward and we thought of that right. idea of them, actually the risers pulling back as they're walking mm-hmm. with the audience. Mm-hmm. And then when James goes on to the, you know, the snow landscape and then the, the risers push back. You know, fake them out. But isn't there just such a concept in general that eventually the audience won't notice? There are going to be a lot of, I think there should be a bunch of moves. It's not like, wow, we're moving again. I think it should be, a, isn't there going to be a sense that they're going to move? I feel like there's no Something's way going to happen. To know that yeah, we don't, we're not going to know. I know we're not going to know that, but I think, I think, and not I mean, you can't, you can't that move to it or go like that. It's so like loud when we move it that we're going to have to make that a part of it every time it moves. And then there's a chance. No, I'm serious. Like, we're not, none of us have built a moving riser before. You know, it could be that it's like, cuckoo, you know? It could be really jarring. Yeah, but in that case, we're going to have to it's make that. It's not going to move ah, fast, that's God. for sure. I mean, I don't, <laughs> it's going to be so heavy that I don't think it's going to be moving quickly. And I don't think that it will be able to lurch. I don't think that it's going no, to be strong might be... enough to have a, mm-hmm. it might have a, it could have a jarring stop if we can. What's the stopping mechanism on this thing? Oh, we don't know yet. The What's the next thing to figure out? <laughs> Let's test it outside. <laughs> <laughs> on that like cobblestone hill <laughs> oh look 398 it's 50 cents more uh oh we're getting closer oh, to 405 oh, three, six, oh, oh I don't know what these numbers are changing on me. that's for diesel bro though no no dude it changes look oh 365 and 405 but this green is, I thought that was for diesel. I really did, but maybe I'm wrong. Diesel, Cash. it is. Cash. 405 is diesel. There's four, there was four Look different. Look back, it says diesel. I know, but there's four <laughs> different numbers. There was two numbers, and then those two numbers changed to two Understood. different other numbers. All the yellow, all the red was <laughs> us, and all the green was diesel. Are we in agreement on that much? Sure. Uh, uh, no, sure, or yes? No, no, sure, yeah, but that's, yeah. That's, sure doesn't mean yes. Well, is diesel Sure means I'll go along with it because you always win. <laughs> you become like a, 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 a like a withdrawn, abused wife. Sure. I, no, no. The point. Sure. I. No, the reason I'm not going to say I agree is because I didn't notice that. That's. I knew one of them was diesel. I wasn't. I. I figured the cheaper one was regular gas. You know what I mean? Yes. That you believed. You believed me on verdant. I believed. I is believe you on this di- as well. But the point is that the, I, I, it doesn't. It's beyond. It doesn't matter. You don't have to apologize. <laughs> uh. I just have to. Tell Nick that uh, I, I wrote down something that you said last night in oh, the concert. Jesus. <laughs> because it was Did so that I classic. That in the concert? Yes. <laughs> and you said. Like, like as an, an, in public? Yes, and I think no, we'll I be on the radio. You played yeah. last night? What did I say? Probably. What you I said, say? we're just, this piece. Oh, are you quoting directly right now? <laughs> okay. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. So far, we have. Okay. I think it's a paraphrase. You, yes, you were talking about the Boccherini like. piece. Like you got to say like before. Yeah. You <laughs> and you said something like. Yes, there you go. Now you can say anything. <laughs> <laughs> this. Totally We're just five guys exploring each other's textures. Oh! <laughs> Yes. Yeah, and so? I, and I, I just love that, that so much that, that I wrote it down. That's brilliant. <laughs> you were at the concert. That's no, what I no. meant. <laughs> it takes a big man Thank you very to much. admit that, yes. No, that's even better. In public, than, totally on amazing. the radio. <laughs> They're beautiful. <laughs> They're beautiful guys. One of the things I'm interested in working on this ride idea is losing people, actually physically losing people in the space so people don't know where they actually are, you know. Well, the new space is so daunting, it's like... Yeah, but it's becoming more, the more that we set up stuff and the more that we divide the space up and look at it from different things, it's becoming clear to me like what, like what's possible in that respect. This ride idea is very interesting to me. and actually not, not compromising on, on an idea is a little bit scary 
to me and actually having an idea and trying to go through with it is sort of a first and I'm really in interested in seeing what happens with that. Um, because I feel like we have a grandiose idea and we're like, oh, that would be great. And then we say, well, what else could we do that would give that Im impression or illusion or something? Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in having an idea and going through with it. And I think that's actually really important. There's committing to an idea, but then it's like... There's also a direct, I feel like there's a difference between an idea and just a general direction that you're going in. I feel like you can right. know, like, we're going west mm -hmm. um, because there's a magical land that lies in the west. And how we get there is going to be a series of ideas and choices that we make, you know, de ideas that we execute and choices that we make about those ideas in terms of getting to that mm. place. Sometimes we'll have something written down. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's a page of text and you say we're going to use it. I think one thing that works well is if you commit to using that and you say, how do we make it work? And everyone can figure out a way to make it work. You could also take that page and throw it in the garbage, but, you know, and that's happened many times with us. But I think occasionally you have to say, no, I'm going to be bullheaded about this and let's use our creative know-how to make it happen. And if you are constantly second-guessing some core principles of what you're doing, then it's just going to be really annoying. and nothing's gonna happen even on like little tiny steps like if you're acting in a scene even just to get your first foot in front of the other you're you're basically making a choice right it's like how do you I guess hmm, I don't know maybe that doesn't work <laughs> but it's like how do you get like out the out of the house if you if you're so open to every thing that's going on it's like well we, did I, what are you guys laughing about? No, I was that? just thinking blink decision versus, you know, thinking about a decision. Like, uh -huh. improv, you know, in the moment having to make that decision. But Your process-oriented thing, having a month to decide whether to use that piece of paper or not. And they're actually the same process. They just, the I timeline the is totally yeah. different. And sometimes you do something yeah. that's improvised and it works well one day and that doesn't work at all the next time because the energy is just different and you have to acknowledge that you have to say it's not working and yeah but I think that's slightly different than not committing to a large well, I like that I like what you were saying about West or like having a compass like mm -hmm. where you know your general direction and you, you know you're gravitating towards something but you can flow with it a little bit but it, it's always hard because like you have to make decisions. But of course, as you said, those decisions are true one day and are not true another because of the space you're in, because mm -hmm. of the people. The so way, the I think the, the compass them. becomes hugely important then because it's like, all right, at least we know we're going f towards that. And we'll find, you know, we'll make decisions that help us go there. I think I remember talking to a famous actor he just kept telling me, it's all about the process, it's all about the process. And uh, I was a very result-oriented person. I thought in my mind, I was just, I just was looking at the result. How is what I do now going to affect me then? What is it going to look like? How can what I do in this moment affect that? And then how will that be perceived? And that didn't feel that didn't feel right. And when I heard this actor say, "Process, man, process," I thought, "Yeah, yeah, I gotta. I want to shift that gear around a little bit. Like, I gotta. It doesn't feel right to just be thinking about the result. You know, I gotta live in the moment. It's about the process." But recently, having finished a project, um, I got so much out of the completion. Now, again, it's not that I was in the beginning of the process and looking toward the end, but I do really now value the completion. Getting a chance to look at the final thing, here, getting reflections from people's comments, and also having some real, real distance yourself, able to reflect on what I did, why I did it, there's a lot, a lot of value in that. I don't know. Uh, I should have wore a hat. I should have wore a hat.
when you're learning your technique and you're focused on technique so much for so long, uh -huh. like at what point do you feel like you forget about oh, like how the point where you know it's like it doesn't help? It doesn't. That yeah, takes yeah. a long better. time, and it's like. Well, but I think I, also wait, wait, like wait, in, the, in the teaching, in the teaching from the beginning, <laughs> it should be like not. It's never divided. It's never <laughs> divided. <laughs> like <laughs> if you d if the teacher has divided it, then that actually requires a lot of like <laughs> psychological <laughs> help to put them back together. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, yeah. I feel like when going to Juilliard, most students were having a that problem, which was. You go and you start being so technically um, freaked out on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. pressured that you just forget every reason why you're right. <laughs> enjoy it <laughs> or why you're doing yeah. it, and it's hard to let to know what parts to let go of again and how to get back to your own thing and right. use what you learned <laughs> and it's just maybe like, it's like I think everybody dance. struggles it, I think in dance it's maybe different point. than in music because like Bill I work with Bill T. Jones and sometimes he'll intentionally um, hire dancers who have very little training technically because they have such an honest performance quality about them that that I mean deciding to do that once you've decided to do that then using I, I guess what I'm thinking about is the Ives thing and then you were like no, people should sing in tune. <laughs> yeah, okay. Right, right. So well, people right. should play in tune. Place. No, because we right. when we when we play uh, when we play a quartet or when we play an orchestra thing, we actually are in a situation with a bunch of professionals and we have a common goal. And the common goal is more important than the technical thing. And so when you when you decide to do a community thing with non-trained people or if you're singing a church choir with non-trained voices, what was important to Ives was fulfilling the goal of that moment. Sure. And so There's only like a common goal. So the common goal is more important than the By technical the proficiency. What she wants to have but it, it all is tailored to what is the what is the situation. Right. Right. A group right. Right. of trained right. professionals, whether right. it's dancers and musicians, and you want to fulfill what that can be, then you have to you have to, have you have to right. play in tune, or you have to right. you know right. move and your arms I mean, in right. unison in, in together. If that's your goal, you know, it's like what what is the goal? Yeah. They call her frivolous. A peculiar sort of a gal With a heart that is mellow An all-round good fellow was my <laughs> old pal Yes? So a Sal was a mule, huh? I've got a mule, her name was yeah. Sal Fifteen miles on the Erie Canal We've hauled some barges in our day Filled with lumber, coal, and hay, cause we know every inch of the way from Albany to Buffalo. Oh, you're ending with a key change? Low <laughs> bridge, everybody down. Low bridge, cause we're coming to town. And you'll always know your neighbor, you'll always know your pal if you've ever navigated on the Erie Canal. There isn't a song about the Delaware Canal. Oh, Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> I was brainwashed at one point in my life. Um, <laughs> maybe I'm being brainwashed right now, and I don't even know about it. I'm cool with that. Um, there, is a, there was a British musicologist and psychotherapist that was active earlier in the 20th century. His name was Hans Keller. And he wrote a lot of really fascinating books about music that were totally uncompr un uncompromising. But he gets really deep into like the world of like Haydn's string quartets and what it meant, you know, what was going on there. Why are they works of genius, you know? And, and he'll even go so far as to say why this work of Haydn is is a masterpiece and why this one isn't, you know. Which I wouldn't go there in a million years, but. But I'm glad that there are people that do that out there in the world. But one of the things that he said that really stuck with me and that I still struggle with, even, even in this conversation, even though I, I think I very much agree with the idea of compromise that we're all talking about in terms of coming to a, a group collaborative decision about something. But he's, he was adamant about the fact that like the compromise is the worst thing that an artist can do, and he's probably turning in his grave because I'm misquoting him, but that's what I remember. The compromise, the, the, the merging of two ideas 
is the worst thing that can happen, you know, in terms of, you know, arriving at, at a vision, say, of an interpretation of said Haydn string quartet out there. And so to me, that's kind of like, I, I struggle with that a lot because, okay, you want to go to the other person and, and mend your ideas in a way, but have you lost your compass? Even the concept itself of giving yourself up to a collaborative group, yeah. I think, is, um, I, I struggle with that all the time. It's hard. Saying. It's hard even when you think it's a good idea. Oh, yeah, it's definitely, I mean, is it harmony that we're after? Because harmony might be easier in strict hierarchy, you know, where one person is making a decision. It might be that people actually feel, or some people would, other people would hate it. So, but I think harmony, in terms of consensus, like if it, because it's not voting, if you, that's not going to bring happiness, that's everyone being unhappy. Maybe it's well, that. Consensus um, is everyone being unhappy? No, no, consensus. Oh. <laughs> means that you've given in to an idea or you've right. won your idea, whatever it is. It, it yeah. involves submission of, of, of a lot of people to an idea. Um, the, the model is not necessarily um, totalitarianism. I think we could all agree probably at this table that that would be a bad idea, but harmony would be a goal. So may, I don't know if it's like there's a roving hierarchy, like at any one moment there is hierarchy but it, it, it is changing constantly. It's not right, predetermined okay or forever. You know? it, the, the flow of it in and out of yeah. yourself. When I, when I had a lot of ideas and a lot of just like raw energy about the piece we're working on now, um, I had really, there were just things that were very palpable. And then just what happens is those things sort of, you absorb them. Mm -hmm. And then I just, and they're not like at my fingertips mm -hmm. right now. And I'm having, I'm having to pull them out. I'm in a different place. And it's just like. And things change so much like when we were talking about it originally. Yeah. The whole thing. And I feel like in a way, the longer we work on it, it's just going to keep changing at the same rate. And right. It's just a matter of like when, when it, you know, as long as we have enough time, you know, when it actually gets done, it's going to hit that place in the cycle, you know, where that's where all of our ideas got to. It's hard too when, you're, when your personal in can sort of change because your idea gets filtered through six people. Or seven yeah, it's people. Very true. So your access point becomes different and shifts somehow and, yeah. and then for like I feel like sometimes for a week or two I can't access the same idea anymore or, or the piece anymore. We, we play in a quartet and that's four equal parts. Quartets were not like that when they were first established as a performing ensemble. There was always a clear leader. They were named after the first violinist. Or the violist in the case of Primrose, but, you know. That's a rarity. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but they were, <laughs> they were, they were yeah. like normally known as the, the last name of the first violinist. Like for example, it would be the what? The, the Paganini the quartet, quartet. quartet. The Joachim quartet. quartet. Okay, got yeah, it. Yeah, the Capet string quartet, string quartet okay. the Bush yeah. string quartet. <laughs> And uh, I could go on. it's a democratic process, and we are, we, I mean, I think we are lucky because we are, you know, about 90% there in terms of agreements. And then so, you know, straying this way or that way, it's not really going to pull us off from the very mm -hmm. basic understanding that we share. And, but we do play in a group called the Knights, as Colin said, and this is a group of 35 people often. And very different personalities, different experiences, musical experiences, life experiences. There are a lot of disagreements and this feeling of like, how are we going to move forward? You know, it's not like this. No, it's not like this. It's not like this. And, um, and, but you want to keep the, the democratic spirit. You want to have everybody heard. And then you also, this idea of uh, Keller, you know, of like the compromise. I would say that there's something to that, that the great recordings, old great recordings that we love listening to, they have an imprint, you know, of someone made that imprint on that recording. Someone made a really strong interpretation, uh, a play or, or, or a film, you know, it has, it has a stamp that someone took all the decisions and then, you know, put it all together into what it is. But don't you think that that could be arrived at by a group? Like that strong, whatever that strong thing is? Yeah, I mean. Like you guys could form that amongst yourselves and it's who's well, and, and say, we do, yeah. and we do. But what I was gonna say is that uh, one, one way that I, I've, I've thought of, I wouldn't see anything wrong with just uh, saying, you lead this project and we will do everything that you say Everything. to fulfill that project. Mm -hmm. And if you say, and if you come to us to a place where you don't know 
how to move forward, then can draw from the pool of you know talent to to move it forward. I do feel like taking away equal responsibility to make the decision of step out of your house, left foot in front of the right foot, is the thing that moves you know that moves things forward. And that's you know that's kind of the the point of having. Well, if you let go, you have to know that someone else is going to be there to, to mm -hmm. hold it up. Yeah. You mm -hmm. can't just let it go and it drops, because then it just won't happen. And in terms of focus, it doesn't mean, I mean, the giving the baton doesn't mean non-participation right. or, or right. Actually, it means like modeling citizenship right. in a way, which can, you know, when you know that you're in that role. And which is really hard, because, of course, if, if, if you have strong opinions, then it's, it's, it's hard to do that thing. Yeah. I it's still rolling. In I'm my confess something oh, to the camera. I am. Okay, I'm going to confess that in a no, no, previous you life. We're not here. We're not here. This would be like your confession mode. This oh, is your but I, but I, it's no good if I don't have an audience. You have an yeah, audience right here. God. Oh, I see. Okay, you have God. <laughs> okay. You have to have a relationship with the camera. All right. Now, they're getting out of the car to look over the top of the mountain. And, um,. I can't do that. I'm still in the car. Because somehow, being up high and looking down, mm, a long way down, does not agree with me. And I was going to tell them that I thought on a previous life I might have been pushed off a high place. At any rate, I don't do well with high places. It's beautiful, but I'm looking the other way at the rocks and the brush. It's gorgeous. And the colors. I told Dion it would be a nice place to get the sketchbook out. And the shapes and the colors and Well, I, I do think that some places are more spiritual than others. I, I think maybe because you're more connected to the, the land, the atmosphere, the, there's more space, there's got your feet on the soil instead of the cement. parents had a small beach house on the Jersey Shore and some of my favorite times were in the winter being out on the beach or the boardwalk when it's cold and you're, you're bundled up and you're looking for shells or whatever I was out there once walking along the uh, the dunes of, of the beach and there's a this kind of I don't know if you'd call it a Cape Cod style slatted little fence half in the sand half out and I'm walking along with a friend of mine we look up maybe about 20 yards up the hill at the top of the dunes, uh, frantically trotting, pacing back and forth is a, is a deer. A very odd sight, just a, 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 like the pinnacle of, of the hill, uh, this beautiful image of the sand meeting the sky with this kind of frantically prancing deer. Out of nowhere, out of nowhere, the, the deer kind of backs up a few yards, just almost out of sight over the hill, and then takes this running leap over the fence, two or three long prances over the course of a 50 yard span right into the freezing cold water. I mean, it was just this crazy like act of you know, survival and, and it just seemed like a suicide mission. The thought of anyone or anything going in that water on that day, a day just like today where we're walking along right now with the crew and it's freezing and you look at the water and it's freezing and the snow and the ice are freezing and and here comes this deer taking just a half a dozen springs and landing in the ocean and continuing to swim at full bore away from whatever was out of our sight above the hill some wolf or, or something just so wild and, and like something that would be from a Kubrick film or something I was at a lesson, I was like playing whatever, 
And like oh, she remember. playing what? I was just playing some something. I don't even remember. I was playing the violin. Yeah. And she was like, she looks at me and she says, why is your stomach darker than your face? Uh. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, what? Like, why are you saying that to me right now? <laughs> and she was like, well, your stomach is always so dark. And I'm just like, what are you so talking I'm about? Like, ew, why are you looking at it? <laughs> you're, like, you're like, Sally, get out of my bedroom right now. And I was like, this is over. I can't have lessons in my bedroom anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I fluctuate between 149.5. <laughs> Honestly. And 150? And 152.5. So, like, you, I have, like, a three-pound. you tell me, you're like, okay, this is my year. I'm putting on weight. Well, You yeah, told me that. You're yeah. like, I'm going to eat so much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bulk it's up. It's true. I ran out of money, though. <laughs> it's time, you're not dedicated. You he either can't I afford a strong. gym or he can't afford food. I went strong for like three days. I was eating a lot. <laughs> three <for> days. <laughs> <laughs> How much did you put I, on in those three I days? I was seriously have been between the same three pounds for about 10, 11 years now. Me too. Same Remember three pounds. Remember when I was living with you and you used to eat like a pound cake? And a milk before you went to bed. Was that to gain weight? <laughs> that was part of my weight gaining phase. So I'd come up with a little bag and he'd put it down, he'd set it up on the table, and then he'd open up the thing, he'd get it out, and then he'd take break off a little piece of cake, drink the milk. Okay. And he'd like turn on TV. <laughs> I think you have we to know unwind. Do. Some people, <laughs> you know, have a beer, a cigarette. I have should, a cake and milk. But sometimes you'd have a cigarette too. Oh, it's just Mom is gonna see this. We should stand up. The thing about being alive is, thank you, ma'am. You helped us. <laughs> I think that the thing about being alive is it's a constant alone, back together, community. Alone, reflection, back into community. Every great spiritual leader has always gone to the isolation and back to the, the you know, film. You, know, you, you, you deliver a film. You go back by yourself and you contemplate and then you come and you make a film. You go back, you make a book. You come back, you, you, you act in something. Even Jesus, like, you know, he needed a rest from all. Even the, Jesus. Even Jesus. Even the guy, even that guy who's the top guy. Um, here's, is there anybody there? Yeah. Hello. It's our friend from yesterday. How We're back. Good. Because yesterday we only did these sort of fringe things and we didn't go to the cave, but we want to go to the cave today. Okay, cool. All right. And you know where everything is? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Have fun. Thanks Thank you very much. Take care now. I will. Do you sing in a choir? No. Oh. No, I can't sing. Really? No. You got a good voice for singing. No. All right. Take Trust care. Me. See you, you, Jim. Have a good day. He's got an interesting timbre to his voice. Wait, he's Jim too? Yeah, everybody hears Jim. That's <laughs> part of the requirement. They only hire Jims? <laughs> they only hire Jims. <laughs> Do you know he tried to get his daughter to get into a country club? And Who's they wouldn't accept Groucho's daughter. He didn't have a pool in his house, and he didn't want one because he didn't want freeloaders coming out and just hanging out at the pool all day. He didn't want people taking advantage of him. So the girls wanted to, his girls wanted to swim, though. There was one girl. So he tried to enroll her in a, in a country club, but they said no because she's Jewish. And he said, well, she's really only half Jewish. Could she go in only up to her waist? <laughs> <laughs> My dad is a wonderful violist, you know, is a great musician who has never felt like he's really gotten to the place that he deserves, you know. Even though he's had, you know, good things happen, there has been a feeling in our house that it's, uh, you know, something, something's holding me back, you know, and, and it's not you, it's the world is like, you know, keeping you from really being at the top of your, you know, at, at the top of the thing, of, of who you are. And um, I think like, you know, my sister is also a musician. I think we both had kind of that, those vibes, you know, just flowing around from when we were kids, because we, we did we were like hyper-focused on a very specific thing that I'm not sure that 
even we chose. But at a certain point, you know, there was a thing of like, well, you deserve this and you deserve that. If you believe that, which I think at a certain point I did, the conflict of that was also self-doubt of like, am I actually good enough? I stopped playing for a while. Like, I couldn't reconcile those things. It's still kind of an issue, but I guess it takes a trained mind to like let it pass, and I'm not at that place, you know, where I can just recognize it and see it and let it go. So occasionally it, it pokes its ugly head. I have a great photograph, Long Beach Island, circa 1981, of myself posing with this half a decayed animal skull that I had picked up off the beach, some fur on it, maybe a couple of feathers stuck in either the animal that it was or uh, the animal that had attacked the other animal, and there I am have it it's like the jaw of of the animal i have masking half of my jaw pressed right up against my face um i guess my dad was pretty relaxed about those kind of things i feel like if i saw my six-year-old picking up a half decayed animal skull and pressing it up against his face i might i might put the camera down and <laughs> tell him to drop that thing I'm plagued by when I have a conversation or a meeting or an interview with someone, I walk away, I'm like, they hate me. <laughs> I'm plagued by it. So I'm, I, I have like a self-doubt plague that gets in my way sometimes. I have to recreate the whole conversation. Then I said this, and then they had this little reaction, and then like they didn't say anything else after, you know, or something, you know, I have to replay it. And I spend a lot of time working alone, especially lately. I live in L.A. right now, so I'm a little bit more isolated from... Collab, you know, we used to always, we used to always be together. Twenty hours a day, we were nineteen hours a day. We were together, always working on stuff. And now that we don't work in that same way anymore, I do a lot of my work alone. And then we get into a room with some people and get the stuff done. But it's a lot of the, a lot of my thinking happens in this weird echo chamber. And if the wrong echo gets released into it, then it can, you know, <laughs> just start to reverberate. Uh, and get big, you know, the wave gets bigger and bigger. So that's something that I personally have to work through a lot. And it does, I feel like it does get in my way. I feel like I could be such a more productive, I don't know, successful, whatever. I just something, that something would click for me more if there was that part of my brain that I could just learn how to stroke it and to, you know, give it the big open field to run around and do its own thing in where then I don't have to, I can let it do its thing and... I'm trying to get into some Buddhist metaphor where you just allow it to do its thing instead of try and like carve it out like a cancer. Yeah, I had a friend a number of years ago who was trying to open a jar and broke a tendon. Like broke a tendon and the doctor told her that she, I mean, an incredibly talented cellist was told that she would never play again just because she tried to open a jar. It didn't work out so well for her. And fortunately she's back playing again and, and doing beautifully, but that was kind of a stroke of luck. But that kind of sort of lightning bolt moment, you know, could happen at any time. Actually, some of these problems that we're talking about, I think, are really serious impediments to, to what we do on a daily basis. It's an instrumental called Apache. Yeah. It's, it goes? Goes, 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 starts with this, um, in the 60s, it goes Bow no no, bow no 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 no, bow no no, bow no 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 no, bow bow, bow 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 now this will be perfect. And I like, think. I have to get definitely it. some some jumping, but like really curvy. As a dancer, I've learned so much from you guys, musicians, watching something that I know nothing about, but I see what and I hear what I'm moved by, and I that it it comes back to me in my dancing as far as like what is important 
not knowing anything about, you know, musical technique, as far as dance technique goes, if that's not what it's really, I it's a vehicle for expression. It or goes the other way, too, because if you're a dancer, you, you, you just assume, you know, you, you do the things that you do, and, and it's like, it's a normal routine, but when I started playing with your company, and I saw, you know, like going on tour, and doing the same programs over and over again, and seeing how much intentional work goes into every performance was like shocking because you know you go you like any group goes on tour you know if you're a musician often you know it just becomes a routine you show up like 15 minutes before the show you do the show it's over you know you guys get there like three and a half hours before you know you do your warm-up it's not uh random you know there's a reason behind it you know so it's like you get into the space of being on stage and you're performing and no matter what happens in a performance you're performing for the people so it's like there's there's a the performance attitude you know of like you're giving something to the audience even if something's going horribly wrong you still like <laughs> I'm, I'm, really, I'm actually honestly like, like to switch gears a little bit uh, how was that? Wait, wait, let me try it. Huh? No, seriously, let's let's just switch gears for a minute. No, 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 two switch gears a little bit. Get the line on. Oh, okay. Wait, you really had nothing to say? Let's two switch gears? <laughs> yeah, let's to switch gears. <laughs> no, in order to switch it's gears. It's like let's dot 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 to switch gears a little oh. bit. It's like conversations. Oh, I see. Are people saying that musicians show up 15 minutes before that they can't? That they're not totally stoked to be there. No, because no, no. I was because just saying, I could show up five minutes before and be like, yeah. yeah should yeah, you be should you be play. living what you want to let's let's play. Play. Be more. the whole time? When we talk about our relationship to the audience, I just want to be clear. I understand today what my relationship at the age of forty three is with the audience. I need them. I want them. I love them. But I don't need them to tell me that I'm okay as a person, which is different now. And I'm very grateful for that evolution. I'm doing better commercially than ever before. Is it a coincidence? I think so. I mean, I, I don't think so. I think <laughs> <laughs> all that, just fucking roll the dice. Get me out of here. I haven't had a drink in 16 years. Give me one. <laughs> right there. And the best moment of that whole little freaking speech was the mistake. Because that's where the pressure releases, you know? And we have an exchange. Oh, you know, this packaged fucking line he's given before is over and he made a mistake and then we have our own thing. You know what I mean? That's what I'm thinking. The thing that I learned from working with a dance company is that performing has a lot to do with what you do for somebody else, what you do for the audience. A lot of the time in orchestra, the relationship from the stage to the audience is completely cut off. You have a big group and, and if you're in the back of a section, it, it feels like it doesn't really matter. But the thing is, the audience is not done. The audience feels it right away. So that's the thing. It's like when, when you're in the audience for a dance show, say what you f want about Natural. the performance, the interpretation, the choreography you know that the, the dancers are performing for you. They think it has to do with the amount of training and the amount of people. Yeah. You've got like, not, not like a, a small ensemble of people, of highly trained people performing, but instead a huge ensemble of highly trained people performing. Let's say you've got 90 people on stage and 40 of them are, are have a totally different idea of what the performance should be like. Right. I think it's but, the but the thing is like the highly trained thing is not, it's like, you know, often it's used as a, prerequisite to not do shit. It's like, oh man, you know, I'm highly trained. You know, I've went to school I for this shit. I should be the soloist. I yeah, should be the yeah, soloist. It's like, so stand. what? You're highly trained? Yeah, great. That's yeah. why you're yeah, here. Now do something. But showing you know, up instead of like, I've, I've studied violin since I was five years old. So? I think the supreme challenge in the 10,000 hours of training is to actually be able to do a certain point, and maybe that is the magic thing that happens at the 10,000 hours or the 6,500 hours or whatever you're doing, you're actually able to shift the focus away from yourself. Um, you know, and to me, like, the state of concentration um, means not at all being concentrated in what I'm doing, actually, and being hyper aware of what's happening in the room and what's happening you know, in terms of my colleagues, you know, what are their bow arms doing at a given moment gives focus to my bow arm.
of course, you know, if you show up an hour beforehand to get into the, the, the that space of being ready to perform, it's going to be different. But at the yeah. same time, it's what you've been thinking about the whole time. Sure. It's what you think about all right. day, well, every that's day. That's what I was saying. That's, that's what you yeah. right. well, It's like you can show up five minutes. Boom! It's like yeah, man, yeah, because let's you've do it. already been preparing yeah. for like two like, years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Every performance. yeah. but this well, is well, a that's every thing. musician and every dancer. Yeah, it should well, be. I think it it's just be. I it think they're be. just very they're different they're situations. Different. Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, there's the we we hear from Sandeep, you know, that like an Indian traditional lose. musician would not rehearse with like you yeah, show yeah, up at the gig and and you've had twenty years of training and you. And because the guidelines of that music are such that, like, you know what scale you're playing in and what rhythm you're playing in, then you improvise. Well, you know, it's just, that, it, like, it's just like, it depends you know, on what you're doing. Right. As much pre preparation as you have, Talent. like, you have the opportunity Talent. to fail or, or, I mean, to connect with the other performer or the audience in that situation Talent. as you do with preparation. I mean, it just all depends on Talent. the vibe, uh, the vibe of the performers, the the guidelines that are, set, that are set, the space that you're in, and sure. all of those. But also the piece uh, you're performing, no? And the, yeah. the piece yeah. or the style or the whatever, like really affect how you should prepare or not or whatever, and there's no law. I feel like um, most of, if not all of, the work that I do is created for others to some degree. I don't know that I've ever just created, I, well, I can't think if I've ever just created something entirely for myself. Just put it, locked it up in a box, tossed it in the closet and walked on to the next thing. I guess I do have those things, but it's always been my intention to, to let them out at, at some point. I struggle with the fact that I may want to do something, but I may not, I may not know why. I may not know what the connections are. I may not know, uh, may not have the answer for somebody if asked, why did you do this? And I hate the answer, I thought it was cool, or, you know, it just just seemed right. You know, <laughs> I don't know why. There's, I don't think there's anything wrong with just doing something because you think it's cool, or it just felt right. I think uh, um, whatever you got to do to get stuff done, or certainly whatever I have to do, because... I find that there's a lot more that I want to do that that I stop myself from doing because I I wonder if there are connections there or you got to be critical of the work you know you're not just I, I certainly don't want to just be one of those people that's just you know haphazardly throwing shit up and it's just uh, you know waving my hand at it this is what it is and take it for what it is and it's all great <laughs> When you're playing his music, because it's really part of this collective, which is the Brooklyn Rider, do you feel like it's your music? I, that question is very easy to answer, yes. Because yeah. I, I similarly <laughs> felt that um, way. Yeah. Ultim ultimately, the answer to that question is always yes. Um, you know, you're very generous, I think, you know, as a, as a composing voice, because I think you're also asking us to, to step into the individual parts they create the fabric of the whole um, in a way like it doesn't happen unless that, unless that process happens where people make their parts their own in a way. And I think you invite that in the most natural way, which is great. It actually transforms the composition. Classical composers actually. are totally different. It's like totally yeah, selfish. No, I don't, I don't know if it's totally No, it's different. not totally selfish. I'm very conscious of the audience. But basically, it's like, what can I do from this perspective, which is mine alone? That's a, a very that modern concept, over? though, actually. I think, like, I mean, I think Beethoven fucked it all up. He, he fucked he it all up, right? Yeah. What a jerk. <laughs> but he, we love him. <laughs> he was aware of the myth he was creating about himself. That's what I think. I think he was a rock star and he oh, was, yeah, like, totally. creating a myth around himself. No, well, there's no doubt. But what does that have to do with you? That's the difference, Nothing. basically. No, man, no oh, oh, well, because, like, I was not writing Brukleska as an idea of, like, you know, it's kind of um, redefine redefine music somehow. I was writing something for Neo us to enjoy Gypsy. playing, like the joy of playing together, and that I hoped someone else would enjoy listening to. And that's you know? superior. So that, but, that's but Beethoven, me, I feel that's like superior though. What? 
I think. No, that's I mean, not that's my own. Wait, 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 no, no, no. wait, wait, wait. It, Essentially, it's my own philosophical point of view <laughs> that this an elitist aesthetic asshole. <laughs> wait, 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 no, no, no. No, Beethoven was an elitist <laughs> asshole because also, he said my point of view is superior to everyone else's. Appreciate my point of view. You're saying all I want to do is create something that we enjoy playing together, and therefore people will enjoy listening yeah, to. Yeah, perhaps that's hopefully. So, that that's has much more yeah. in common with everything else other than Beethoven and Beethoven-inspired music. We have all these layers of history that have happened, and I think Beethoven has meant different things to different people at different times, and and it's just impossible to decipher that. But I, what I do know is that we've received a ton of baggage since Beethoven's time. I mean, even from our own teachers. Um, and I think part of the thing about looking at tradition with, with a really critical lens is, is like not to take as, as a kind of word of God, you know, what you receive from your mentors, you know, like this is what Beethoven is in a way. And I think we've all struggled with that, you know, w with our teachers as great as they have been, you know, you never want to just accept that as fact. You actually want to dig into the tradition in ways to actually discover that the tradition is the, that the tradition is true and that it exists for a reason that the power of Beethoven is actually something tangible, not just because somebody told you that it is. And, and coming back to the idea of writing a piece together, I think that was part of the whole idea, is if we can immerse ourselves in the skills of being musicians, whether they be um, improvisatory things or, or compositional things, the carpentry, or the, or the elect electricity of, of making music happen, like building those skills, you actually get to the heart of the tradition that I think Beethoven speaks truest through. And that was really important for us. You know, it, it doesn't have any aspiration to transcend this moment, actually. It just, it just is just supposed to be enjoyment, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think Mozart. he actually t desired to transcend the moment yes, and sir, succeeded at it. So good job, Beethoven, you know. <laughs> I think everybody who creates anything is trying to transcend some kind of moment. You know, it's like getting away from like, no, it can be. like the, you know, the, supposed to be cool. the, the dullness. Now. You know, of 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 moment to moment it's life, just right? So I mean, that's like so. When you go back like three hundred years, who's recording <laughs> the history? Like the guys recording the history are the same guys list who are the. But but the, the creative audience, the creative impulse, okay. I think, is still you know, like a, a special <laughs> okay. and oh, a cherished like one. You know, it's like not a common thing that people are actually <laughs> given this. Yeah, but ability. it doesn't. It doesn't mean that guys who are, you know, only guys like Bach and and Buxtehude no, and his contemporaries are the ones who are <laughs> writing music. That's no, that's and he, you know, like no, none of us, you know, are an elitist in this sense. <laughs> but I think but at you know, that time, whoever's we can have some pasta from the elitist, from no you know Delta. You know, we're all just wandering around this scrubby little rock called Earth, just aching for something extraordinary to happen. We want something extraordinary to happen, and I think. That's what makes us susceptible and open to, and you know what, fine. If you got to take LSD to have a great visual, psycho, psycho spiritual experience, do it, you know? If you've got to believe in ghosts, you know, horror movies don't scare me, man. That's why I asked you guys that the other night. I'd like to see a movie that would scare me.
know, one thing that's been revealed to me, and it hasn't left me yet, so maybe there's something to it. It's an image of, the, of, of, of creation being an explosion, a proliferation out into differentiation and, and complexity, right? All these different things, these different worlds, these different creatures, all the way down to the microscopic and the different... And then this collapse back into unity. And somewhere in that great proliferation of, 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 what is that called? Like, I don't know, there's a word that's like, when things become many things, we're seeing, you know, all these different parts. This, this explosion out, somewhere in that explosion out into... The diaspora. Yeah, it is like that. that that's a mini version of the same thing. This, this, somewhere in that explosion out into multiplicity... There are our minds, too. And our minds returning to unity. Some of our minds return to unity before other of our minds return to unity. And I think that's all part of it. It's like any of these particles at the fringe, it's going to take them longer to get back to the center. And I think there are minds that are further, closer to unity consciousness than I have right now, which is they know all the time that all is one. And I forget it sometimes. And then there's some people that don't know it at all. And they just think it's you know, guns and i got to kill you because if I kill you, your physical body, I will rid myself of my problem. And I think it's a spectrum. I think it's a spectrum of awakening that we're talking about and along. And you, I, you, you always have to deal with your own consciousness where it is. One of the, one really, like the really exciting moment for me was when you wrote For Coca-Cola X. You took the marker and you wrote for Coca Cola Wax on the on that on that platform because you spelled it exactly the way I spelled it, mm -hmm. and like and you'd made it your own like it, like it, it ever, like in in that moment I felt like everyone had absorbed for Coca Cola Wax. Funny, it's a wax that you can absorb, but I felt like <laughs> a, I felt like like it wasn't my idea anymore. Like 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 the, like the idea itself had had become like everyone's idea, mm -hmm. and it had become something that could be anything because we I felt like we all owned it in some way. Anyone could say anything about it, you know, and I really. I felt really good about that. Like I just, it just felt really comfortable. I don't know. Is that really ridiculous? No, I was gonna say I was thinking we should cut it. <laughs> <laughs> so funny because you were saying, Miley, that you learn so much from classical musicians. Like you don't know about musical technique, but you, but you feel the way in which they interact. And I feel like we're sort of retarded when, it, and then like we we show up and I mean we. I don't know. I'm not a performer, you know. So I include myself in this only in like a half half sense, but. I feel like I learned much more from being around dancers just from the openness. Mm, that's there's like there's this like natural relation in your art between between the expression and the physicality of it which is very natural and physicality in our art is like secondary. It's totally secondary. Everything hurts and and it's going to hurt for the next week while you learn this piece and uh, it's totally unnatural and you bend your th even you know you've been playing for years you don't even notice anymore you bend your you your body stop. into like right. totally convoluted uh, you know, forms in order to express something that's unrelated in, to the form in which you express it. You yeah, know, just hearing you, you talk about the dance world and like the, the warm up, and, and then Johnny is saying about the lack of what, it, what an average musician might do. It seems like actually there's a lot that we could learn in a way from each other. You know, like the idea of, of musicians taking that aspect of it more seriously, you know, than we do, and then. And then dancers actually, you know, um, you know, doing what musicians do sometimes, and trust in their their physicality, you know, in the moment actually, which is to say that certain things happen when you perform, that happen to your body, you know, in in the moment in front of oh, an yeah, audience, absolutely. that that just you know you can't warm up for that. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. We made some really incredible experiences where like you know that turned into you know the shows would end and then they would turn into a party that would last all night you know like just amazing experiences and those are you know gone and like you I can tell you that it was an amazing experience and you can see a picture or maybe some video there's you know. something about like a temporal form yeah. you know like I feel that too like what I was saying a couple of weeks after the show is over I'm feeling I've still got the energy you know of the thing but it's like a temporal thing. It's over. It's, it happens over time, and then it's over, and you, you start to wonder, like, do I even did I do anything? Yeah. Like, did this exist? Did it matter? It's disorienting. 
There's also the thing of like building something up so much in your mind over a, a particular you know, performance or a milestone. And many things could happen. You could have a sold out performance with a nice review in the New York Times and you know, everyone loved it and your parents were there and they loved it. And it's just such a great thing. <laughs> the next day, you know, you look at like, looking at your life is like, has my life changed yeah. at all? Yeah, nothing has changed. It's, yeah. You know, <laughs> exactly the same person. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's weird because from a very early age, it's, it's about those like, you know, milestones, just building it and you, can, you're, you, you know, achieving things and, and getting to those. But the day after, is, and it's like, you're, who yeah. are you as a person? And then, <laughs> you know, that could be either good or scary. Destination on the left end, 1.1 miles. Okay, well, did I do something wrong? Because I'm, I think it's behind us. No, oh, did, yeah, I think you passed it. Yeah, you're right. Oh, there's a lady right behind us, just waiting to get on her way. All right, I'm just trying to figure out what's happening here. Zero minutes, so that means it's still recording, but it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's on total it. warning. It's going to end any time, any second now. Well, what I'm saying is, you know, we can commiserate around a table, but I think actually how we proceed and the, the face that we put to the world and actually how we, the face that we put to our colleagues you know, has to be one of total optimism and, and the feeling that there is always room in the world for what, what you want to do creatively and that you can build it. It's a building process and, and that it can always happen. I think that that's the eternal optimism of, I think, what we do and that's why we do it. Even if I'm telling myself a lie, that's the, that's the <laughs> one that, lie. yeah, it's a good lie. It's, it's, it's like, why, n it. why not, you know? <laughs> but I don't, I don't believe it to be a lie. Well, art is art, isn't it? Still, on the other hand, water is water, and east is east, and west is west. And if you take cranberries and stew them like applesauce, they taste much more like prunes than rhubarb does. I lost my train of thought. Thank you.